Good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you, with so many of you here in person, and with those of you tuning in via Zoom and people who are watch on YouTube. First, as we begin, logistics, if you are in this room and a member of the church and do not have a orangish reddish piece of paper, go out into the foyer and get one because we are very close to our quorum today. We wanna to make sure we're counting every person here. It has been a week this week, like so many weeks, a hard week, a week of war in Ukraine, a week of a new interpretation of laws in Texas that makes caring for your trans children legally child abuse, and all of the heartbreaks and heavinesses that just keep piling on in this pandemic season. The pain of the world can be overwhelming. So what can we do? We do what is right in front of us. We give our time and our money and our care and our love and our support to those who are most impacted. Sometimes that is ourselves. We love the part of the world that is within our reach. And today, part of the world that we can reach is this congregation and this congregational meeting. Members of People's Church will, assuming we have a quorum of members present in this space, vote and propose amendments and debate and disagree and hold our disagreements in love, knowing that everyone who showed up in person today cares deeply about People's Church. Everyone who is tuning in to Zoom cares deeply. Everyone who is watching a congregational meeting video on YouTube cares deeply about this church. We might not be on the same page, but we are surely on the same book. And for those of you newer among us, our visitors and our friends, I'm sure a congregational meeting isn't necessarily what you thought you would be showing up to today. And this is an exceptionally good way to get to know us. Church members will be discussing major revisions to our bylaws, among other business. And in our Unitarian Universalist tradition, there is no higher authority than this congregation. The deliberations of today cannot be overruled by me or a bishop or a pope, or some distant authority somewhere. It is you. And we aren't here to create some perfect moment that will last us forever, but to pick up the work that has gone before and bring it to better serve us in this moment, knowing that those who come later, maybe even, probably even some of us in this room, will then propose more amendments and more changes and continue to carry this work forward. We are a living tradition, and that means what is most important and how we manage ourselves keeps changing to prepare us for the moment that we are in. So today we will make our foundational documents and governance practices more in line with our most deeply held values. The people in the room will likely make changes to allow people who are participating virtually to be able to vote the next time we have a congregational meeting. And that action, drawing the circle wider, making it so more people can have a voice about what matters most to them, is what the world needs in this moment. People caring for each other, noticing who is left out, and doing the work of inclusion. So may we be about this holy work the sacred task of congregational governance. May we use for good our power. And when the work of democracy is done here in this room today, may we carry it with us 
into all corners of our lives, to all of the parts of the world that are within our reach. It isn't enough, perhaps, for this moment, for all of the overwhelmingly hard things unfolding around us, but it is what we can offer and no move towards love or justice or inclusion is ever wasted. So come, let us gather together. Come, let us worship and deliberate and vote together. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to People's Church. Whether you are in this space with us through Zoom or in person, if you are here for the first time or the hundreds of time, we are glad that you have chosen to gift us with your time and energy to be in community with us today. I'm Susan Mordike and I'm honored to be here today serving as president of your board of trustees as we come together today to weave together our diversity of thought and perspective to revise the bylaws that guide how we function as an institution committed to being a beloved community, embracing and serving our diverse world. People's Church is a member congregation of the Unitarian Universalist Association, part of a long tradition of liberal religion. We are people of all ages, people of many backgrounds, and people of many beliefs. We are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. We create spirituality and community beyond boundaries, working for more justice and more love in our own lives and in the world. Thank you for being with us today. Our reading for our chalice lighting today is This is the Hour by Reverend Connie Simon, who serves as minister of First Unitarian Church of Cincinnati. If you are lighting a chalice at home today, you are encouraged to type in the chat box, a chalice is lit in your neighborhood slash city slash street. And I believe it will be shown on the screen. This is the hour. The time has come, mindful of our responsibilities as leaders of this faith and guardians of the living tradition. We call upon the great cloud of witnesses, those who came before, those who are here now, and those who have yet to come. We seek their presence, love and support in this place at this hour. We kindle this flame to light their path and call them near as we undertake this sacred work.
Thank you. Thank you for that. It's very strange to be in this room and not actually sing the song. Hopefully our health conditions will change in the not too far future to allow us to be able to at least sing a little bit, even if it's behind our masks. I'm going to be very truthful with you today. I'm shaking right now. This is big work. This is very big work. It's transformational in what we do as an organization. And I am honored to be here and trusted with leading you in this work. So today we gather on the land of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Indigenous nations of the Great Lakes region are also known as the Anishinaabe or original people, and their language is Anishinaabe Moen. We acknowledge the enduring relationship that exists between the people of the three fires and this land. And today we gather to engage in people's ritual of shared democratic leadership. Today we have the opportunity to participate in discussions that may challenge our comfort zones as we evolve as an organization that is a beloved community embracing and serving our diverse world. I have confidence that we as the strong community that we are have the ability to navigate these waters together. Love will guide us. Peace has tried us. And hope inside us will lead the way. Do we have our tellers in the room? Will the tellers please report the number of members in attendance? There are 70 members present in the room. 74. 74. <laughs> Thank you, Tana. We have 74 members in the room, which constitutes a quorum under the current bylaws, our current constitution of People's Church. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here on Zoom. This is a unique opportunity, and, and we are going to give those of that are on Zoom that would like to make comment throughout this meeting, the opportunity to do so. Um, so they can help inform the conversation, but yet unfortunately we are limited to the people in the room actually being able to have a vote. That was the best compromise that we could manage to help make sure everyone has a voice today. So I believe, can we switch to the agenda page, please, Reed? So this is the agenda that was put out in, our, in its revised format last Friday through the Friday email and posted online. Are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda is approved as presented. Here comes my faithful guide person. He's really gonna, he's really gonna put that more in front of me. I'll tell you, this is a unique experience because I don't do this every week like Rachel does, right? So. Just bear with me. All right. So the first business is the approval of the minutes of the 2019, believe it, 2019 annual meeting held in May 19th, 2019, and the ratification of the business conducted at that meeting. 
those minutes are in your packet if you have not had the opportunity to read them in advance. Does anyone have questions on the 2019 annual meeting minutes and business? Someone's going to have to tell me if there are any questions through the Zoom because I can't see it. I'm getting a no. If there's no objection, the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting will be approved and the business conducted at that meeting will be ratified. Having heard no objections or questions, the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting are approved and the business conducted at that meeting is ratified. Thank you. The next business is the approval of the teller's report of the 2020 annual meeting held May 17th, 2020 and the ratification of the business conducted at that meeting as shown in the teller's report. Please keep in mind that we were new to doing business in a virtual space and that there was not a secretary assigned during that particular call. So the formal record of the business is the teller's report. Does anyone have any questions on the 2020 annual meeting teller's report and business? Because if there are no objections, the teller's report of the 2020 annual meeting will be approved and the business conducted at that meeting will be ratified. Questions or objections? All right, I'm getting the nod that there are no comments from the, our Zoom participants. So the teller's report of the 2020 annual meeting is approved and the business conducted at that meeting is ratified. Third, last one, promise. Next is the business is the approval of the minutes of the 2021 annual meeting held May 16th, 2021, and the ratification of the business conducted at that meeting. Does anyone have any questions on the 2021 annual meeting minutes and business? If there's no objection, the minutes of the 2021 annual meeting and the teller's report will be approved and the business conducted at that meeting will be ratified. Hearing no objections or questions, the minutes and tellers report of the 2021 annual meeting are approved and the business conducted at that meeting is ratified. All right, so the first three are off the list already. Look at that. Thank you for, for doing that. This... So now we reach the heart of our purpose today. If we were able to sing together as a group, we would probably sing a song right now. We would probably do People of Hope or some other song that we consider an anthem in the tradition of our congregation. As that's not possible today, please imagine with me this. Imagine that we are in a circle, that we are able to look at each other face to face on equal footing and equal grounds. Imagine that you in this room and online are the heartbeat of this organization. So if you are willing and able, please stomp a foot. You are the heartbeat. You are the heartbeat. Thank you. We have attempted to organize this session today to move as quickly as it is able while still being thorough and thoughtful. 
So I would like to invite Sherry Harris to come forward as the next business is the proposed revision of the Constitution of People's Church. Good morning. When the nine members of the newly formed bylaws committee met for the first time on July 23rd, 2019, we had no idea that we would not finish our proposed draft until November, 2021. After 33 formal meetings, as well as many small working group meetings. There are several reasons for the length of time in finishing our work, the biggest perhaps being the COVID-19 pandemic, which pushed us to meet online, which we did, it worked. Another was the fact that we used a process of consensus rather than majority rules as we worked through all the articles. But the outcome is that the final product was submitted to the board with unanimous consent from the bylaws committee. Then in September, 2021, a small group from our committee created the videos and the explanatory material, which was made available on the church website <laughs> as an opportunity for the congregation to understand our proposed changes and input. In-person and Zoom meetings held in September, the in-person were outdoors, and early October were opportunities to gather further input from members and to answer questions. The bylaws committee considered all concerns from members carefully as we prepared the final draft, which was submitted to the board this past December and is currently posted on the church website and copies are in the, um, the handout you received. So I want to acknowledge the members of the bylaws committee for their continued hard work and dedication to this project. Will the members of the committee who are present please stand? The members are Barbara Davis, Robert Harden, Denise Hartso, Carolyn Heidemann, Brian Lewis, Marge Leitner, Mary Kate Webster, Diane Warden, and I, Sherry Harris. Thank you. Now, on behalf of the bylaws committee, I move the adoption of the proposed revision of the Constitution of People's Church, which is presented in the document titled Draft 112921 Bylaws of People's Church of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry, for introducing us to your document and the process that was followed. So I've been advised by our parliamentarian that since this is a motion from the committee, there is no second required. And on behalf of the congregation and the board of trustees, we thank the bylaws committee for your commitment of time and energy to create this document for our consideration. At this time, I invite the members of the bylaws committee and the board of trustees members that are present to transition from their roles as leaders of the congregation in a formal capacity to the role of individual contributor for the following conversation, so that this is truly a conversation among members. So 
So as shown in the agenda, we will proceed with identifying the articles that require further discussion and or amendment and those which do not. So the purpose of this is that if there are articles that are not identified as needing further conversation, that we can take an action on those articles as a group, and then they are done. And then we can move into the work of individually addressing the articles for which people would like to have conversation. Formally in the Roberts Rules of Order, it's called debate. I really am uncomfortable with that word because we are not here to address each other. Commentary addresses the article, right? And your position or commentary on the article that is in front of us. So I will go through the 12 articles, asking you to raise your voting card if you wish to amend or debate it. If you are on Zoom, please use the raise hand feature so that Reed can see if there are people on Zoom that would like to have commentary. We'll record the results as we go so we can vote to accept the articles where discussion is not requested as a group. Is there any objection to this organization? Hearing none, we will move forward. And also just so that you're aware, we did decide to use the side-by-side -side comparison so that it would be easy for people to see the difference between the existing constitution that we are working under right now against the revisions. This is still the formal language that's in the pretty document where it's just the, just the proposed bylaws. Is there anyone that wishes to have further conversation or potentially amend article one, which is the name? If you would like to discuss or amend, please raise your card. We have one person in the room that would like. Is there on anything online, Reed? Okay. Is there anyone that would like further discussion? or potentially amend Article 2. If there is, please raise your card. There are none in the room. I'm getting the shake that there's not anyone wishing discussion on Article 2. Someone put on chat that they can't find the articles online. The articles online are under, under the Engage With Us tab yeah. on the people's website. And the document is the side-by-side -side comparison. I'm pretty sure I already know the answer to this one. But we'll we'll we will formally follow our process. If you wish to discuss or potentially amend Article Three, please raise your card. If you wish to discuss or potentially amend Article Four membership, please raise your card. We were trying to put these on the screen. I don't know if we were able to make that happen.
Yeah, for now, if you can just go to the list of um, articles, that would be great, perfect. We had this wild idea that we'd be able to like have a chart and put them up so that you could see which ones were which, but some of us aren't really technologically <laughs> uh, advanced in that way. All right, so moving on, is there anyone that li would like to discuss or potentially amend Article 5, Board of Trustees and Officers? If there is, please raise your card. Yes, there is a request to discuss or potentially amend. Is there anyone present that would like to, to discuss or potentially amend Article 6, Meetings of the Board of Trustees? If there is, please raise your card. We have one. Is there anyone that would like to discuss or potentially amend Article 7, duties and responsibilities of the Board of Trustees? If there is, please raise your card. Online, Reed, is there anyone? Okay. Article seven, I see no request to discuss or potentially amend. If you would like to discuss or potentially amend Article eight, congregational meetings, please raise your card. I see none in the room. Is there anyone, and I'm getting the no, there isn't anyone online. Is there anyone that would like to discuss or potentially amend Article 9, Minister? I see none in the room. And I'm getting the shake that there are none online. Is there anyone that would like to discuss or potentially amend Article 10, Nominating Committee? If there are, please raise your card. I'm getting the no online. So no discussion or potential amendment to nominating committee. Is there anyone that would like to further discuss and potentially amend article 11, budget and finance? If there are, please raise your card. I see, I have one. Hold please. Is there anyone in the room or online that would like to discuss or potentially address or amend the removal of the original church year language, which is not specifically an article, but it is in your document? If there are, please raise your card. Don't see any in the room, Reed saying no. Is there anyone that would potentially like to, would like to discuss and potentially amend Article 12, Amendments, Conflict and Dissolution? If there are, please raise your card. Online? No, okay. All right. Okay, we're getting there, Brian. Just, yeah, just hang in there. We're getting there. We're getting there. Barb was kind enough to write me a script. So I have a little bit of a guideline here in, in front of me. Not a problem. It's a good question. Okay. All right, so we've done that part. 
So now you have indicated that articles, excuse me, that article two, Okay. Just, I'm having an ink pen failure. <laughs> Bless you. That article two article four. Okay, sorry. Thank you. I am right on article two though, right? Yeah. That's excellent. Article four. We'll need discussion. So article two, article. I have lost. Article seven. Article eight. Article nine, article 10, the removal of the church year and article 12 do not require discussion or debate. 12. Yes, article one ha has a request for conversation. Lois? Would the group concur with that? Lois has brought up that Article 5 also did not require discussion or debate. Okay. See, this is why I have a lot of people that help keep me organized, right? Denise, could you please record what you have for the minutes about the articles that do not require debate? Do not. Do not. So again, to repeat, you've indicated that articles two, seven, eight, nine, 10, the removal of the language for the definition of the church year, 11 and 12. Okay, so welcome to our imperfect process. This is why I ask, because then we'll get it together. All right, so two, seven, eight, nine, ten, the removal of the church year and twelve require no further conversation or debate. Is that accurate? I'm getting nods. All right. Is there any objection to approving these articles as recorded just now as a group? So all those, since, since there's no objection, all those in favor of approving the articles 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, the removal of the church year and article 12, raise your voting cards, please. I think we can agree that there being a two thirds in favor of the articles as recorded are approved. You need to offer the, the ability oh. to say no. So ask for okay. Rewind. All those that would like to vote against approving the articles 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, removal of the church year and article 12. If you're not in favor, please raise your card. Excellent. There being a two thirds in favor, the articles as recorded are approved. You have now just addressed more than half of the document. And we are at 
1130. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to move in to where there is just debate and action on each article as required. Uh, Barb has been kind enough to provide me with guidelines about facilitating amendments and debate and format. And I will do the best that I can to navigate all of that for you. So the, the way that this is going to proceed is that if you would like to speak or ask a question, we'd ask you to come to which microphones? We're gonna use the one here. Okay, to come up and use the microphone on our table here to address the group. Um, and my understanding of the way this works is it's very similar to the way that we do our Sunday services during the summer, where people come, can come forward, they can share their perspective, addressing the article, right? Not addressing each other as members, but to provide your commentary for consideration by the larger group and then the larger group can digest that to take the action that they would like to take. I get that right? She says I got it right. So there are there any questions about that? Nikki? Yes, that is the intention. Nikki asked if we're going to address the drafts of the proposed amendments that were shared by members of the congregation in advance of voting on the article. And yes, that is the intention. And also, obviously, it's welcome that if there are people in the room that did not provide them in advance, you obviously have the opportunity to present while we're here in the room. And again, we will do the best we can to make sure that the people that are on Zoom have a turn to speak. And again, my understanding of it is everybody gets to speak one time first, and we have to make sure that everyone that wants to speak has spoken before anyone speaks a second time. So... Thank you. So we are going to take these in numerical order. And so if there was one question or comment, at least that someone wanted to make about the proposed name. So if that person could come forward. And if I don't know the answer to the question, if it's a question, we will try to make sure that we give it to somebody who can. Yeah. Hello, is that on? It is on. So very good. If you could state your name, please. Yes, Teresa Klan. Um, so the article one, um, our name, The People's Church, and I re actually remember a sermon on that, and it was wonderful. Um, so my question is, how are we, going to reinforce that. I'm thinking about, you know, if we're in the phone book, it should be listed under T instead of P. Um, you know, the name of our out front, does it say the people's church or do we need to change our signage? Um, the actual, you know, our, um, uh, our <laughs> articles or is it, right now it says people's church versus the people's church. So who's responsible to change all? Yeah, this lady says she can answer that question for us. There's no requirement to change anything. The reason it's capitalized in there is because the state of Michigan sees us as uh, in our incorporation documents, we are the people's church. However, the state of Michigan also alphabetize us starting with P. So you don't have to really worry about that. OK, it was just that we noticed it as we looked at the Articles of Incorporation, which go back to 1949, by the way, so. Does that answer your question, your concern, Teresa? It's kind of like a book, right? Like when you go look up a book, we don't look under the. 
we look under the next word, right? Any other questions or comments? Any potential revisions to Article 1? Anything online, Reed? Thank you. So all those in favor, and again, the motion was made by the committee, right? So we're just acting from that. All those in favor of approving Article 1 as presented, raise your voting card. Thank you. Anyone not in favor of approving Article 1 as presented, raise your card. All right, so now I got to go back. Just a minute. There being a two thirds in favor, Article 1, as presented by the bylaws committee, is approved. We've already addressed Article 2. So, Article 3. To say that I've learned a lot about this congregation in the last few weeks is an understatement. And I would like again to express my gratitude and the board's gratitude for your engagement in this very important conversation. That is what makes us strong. As Rachel said in her opening comment, we don't always agree. I think the thing that we can agree based on the mission and vision that has already been approved by this congregation, that there is no question that this congregation is committed to equity within our organization and outside our organization. I am hopeful that through the conversation today, that this overarching document can be approved in some form to support the mission and vision and the commitment of this community to equity. And again, this is an overarching statement. It sets a direction for the congregation. The bylaws document itself does not address all the details for how we get there. That work is done in policy, it's done in our practices, it's done in your committees, it's done in every piece of church life that you engage in. And we can certainly unpack what this looks like in reality and in practice, in further conversation, we would welcome that. So again, please remember, there is not anybody in this room or on the Zoom call that is not committed to equity that I have found. So now we move forward with the work of how do we say it? So thank you. So to Nikki's question about whether or not we're going to address the proposed amendments and decide if we're going to incorporate those amendments, that obviously has to happen before we vote on the article. So we have two known proposals that have been put forward and I would suggest that we address them in numerical order. Is that acceptable? Okay. So, Nikki, if you would come forward, if you would like to formally make your uh, amendment proposal to the congregation, please. Yeah, but you're in numerical order. Yep. Please use the microphone. 
so our Zoom friends and everyone in the room can hear us. Uh, my amendment is in the packet and the one on article three, because I had two different objections, only an amendment to article three. Reed, I think it, her amendment is in the slides. If you can move to that, please. Um, I had an objection to the wording of racism and all other oppressions. Um, Article three is getting rid of all of the separate little identities and putting them all together into oppression. And it starts out that way with saying, Um, changing ourselves, our organization, and our society, um, it, uh, the dignity, it, it's, and, it, and it's dismantling all forms of oppression and commit to changing ourselves. So it starts out by saying all forms of oppression. And then in A, it takes it and it breaks out racism and in this country, slavery was the original sin. Um, and as I explain in here, Ms. Wilkerson, who is a African-American author, is arguing that casteism is really what happened in this country, that race is an artificial concept. And so we shouldn't be I don't think we should be breaking out any of the forms of oppression because as I explained to one friend of mine, when I first read that, it was like dismantle racism and oh yeah, right. There are other forms of oppression. And it put, in my mind, it put all the other forms of oppression second to racism. Semantically, it really does do that by English standards. Um, and so my amendment was just simply to get rid of that and say, dismantle all forms of oppression and make everything equal, which is what we were doing in this by um, in the second line there, we affirm the need to dismantle all forms of oppression. So that was, that was my amendment to this. Hang on just a second. I'm getting some coaching, coaching here. But thank you, Nikki. Yeah, I, I'll help with that piece. So as, as I'm being coached, the formal way to, to present Nikki's motion, which I might have to ask you to actually repeat it because officially I'm not supposed to make the motion, right? But the official way to make this motion is that we, amend to strike that. that we amend to strike the word racism and from article section 1A. So if you just repeat that. Uh, I move to amend by striking out uh, racism and from article 31A. Thank you. Is there a second? We have multiple seconds. Pat, are you all right with that having yours? There's multiples, but we need at least one name in the record. Okay, so. So before we move on, is there anyone that would like to make a comment addressing Nikki's proposal. Carolyn, if you'd come forward. And again, remember that you're speaking to the language in the document and why the language in the document should or should not be amended. I'm finding myself having a little bit of the same phenomenon as um, Susan. I'm shaking a little bit. Um, 
why would we lift up one form of oppression and name it separately? We cannot work on any one form of oppression without working on all of them at the same time. This is well accepted and pretty thoroughly practiced in the activist community. Nikki mentioned Isabel Wilkerson and the book Cast. Highly recommend that book. It's profoundly powerful. And there are many other BIPOC, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and all peoples of color. So there's another example of the and all peoples of color. Um, what I hear at conferences and workshops and books and articles and seminars from the BIPOC community is that their experience of encountering white people and white organizations is that they consistently avoid talking about racism. When the option of just saying all forms of oppression is presented, white people generally will talk about classism or sexism or transphobia. They'll find something else to talk about. So what has been asked by many BIPOC communities is as we are doing our work. So I'm speaking to those in the room, I just noticing I might have been making assumption that everyone here identifies as white. That's probably not true, but to those who do, we tend to avoid the conversation. And so we have been asked directly by BIPOC communities to lift up that word as a reminder that it's critical to work on that and not bypass into other conversations. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak to this amendment before a vote? Is there anyone online? So my understanding of the process is that the vote now is whether to accept the proposal that's been put in front of us to amend Article 3, 1A, to strike the words racism and. This part of the vote only requires a majority vote, not a two thirds vote, because it's an individual section. As no one else has come forward or raised their hand. Yes, we do have one. See, now I need even more than one pair of eyes. Or something. Oh, there it is. Um, hi, um, it's Lise here. Um, I wasn't sure what to say, but I was feeling my uh, my blood pressure rising by not saying anything. So I had to come up and say something. And mainly I wanna agree with what Carolyn was saying. I don't have a lot to add. I just didn't wanna only hear one voice um, putting that forward. So I wanted to come in and just stand here and say what Carolyn said. I think it was really powerful. So thanks. One last call for comments. All right, so again, the vote that is before us right now is whether or not we are going to amend Article 3, 1A to strike the words racism and. If you are in favor of that amendment, please raise your voting card. Okay. Just hang in there with us while we do a little bit of a count.
19, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I get 21. Okay. So, so there are 21 in favor. If you are opposed to amending the language in Article 3, 1A to strike the words racism and, please raise your voting card. Two, three. This is to keep it the way it was, the way it was originally presented. That is correct. Correct. It would keep the words racism and. I get about 40. We are at least at 40. We have 74 members present. So that would mean we have a vote to keep the language as originally presented. But I'd like to thank Nikki for bringing that forward so that there's a conscious conversation and decision by the group as a whole. So before we move on to the next piece, is there, is there any other comment, question, or conversation about the language in Article 3, Section 1. Seeing none, is there, I'm getting a shake of no on the Zoom. Is there any further discussion about potentially amending or any questions on the language as presented by the bylaws committee for Article 3, Section 2. Yes, if you if you would like to discuss the language as it's as it's written right now on anything other than what we just voted on. We're, that's where we're getting to because he's proposing an additional section, section three. So I'm trying to make sure that we've covered any conversation about what's already in the document before we get into that. Okay. So the process that we're doing is we're trying to get the amendments in place and then have the conversation about the entire article. So if you can, that way we can talk about it the way it's potentially been amended. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I don't understand this part, but you know, I okay. What's actually been voted to keep in? I'm sorry, well, the amendment was voted down. Yes, the amendment, making the amendment was voted down. So I'm hearing no requests for a conversation about any of the other language as written in Article 3, Section 1 or 2. Yes. Yes. If you could come, we do have a question or a suggestion regarding Article 2. Good morning. For, sorry, Article minutes. 2, Section. Article 3, Section 2. Sorry. Elizabeth Warner, Section 2 of Article 3. Are y'all there? I would like to suggest changing the language centered on to informed by, as in thinking through the documented um, comments on this article from other members. So I'd like to recommend we change centered on the lived experience to informed by. Okay, right, hang on, Elizabeth, don't go anywhere just yet. So how does that need to be phrased? Because she's she suggested did she, she, she did, did it fine. fine. All right. So you're done. Thank you. Does need a second. Do we have a second? Rochelle, I see a second and I heard one from over here as well from Tim. All right. Are there any comments or questions? Come on forward.
And again, the question before us is to change centered on to informed by. I would like uh, the last speaker, Elizabeth, to uh, explain why she wants that change. Thank you. I appreciated the um, written reflections of fellow members and thinking about where is our litmus test for achieving and living into action the words that are written in our bylaws. And that from a position of privilege, I want to be able to very humbly seek input and be guided by the experience of people different from myself and in systems that can systematically um, oppress or marginalize. And I do not know if we can assess our success as a church in living into our mission by having that seeking and learning be centered on, or are there other things which much inf must inform it, but we need to be explicit about uh, explicit about learning what we don't know and don't see um, in our in the way that we go about and live our world, we live our lives. I'm not didn't wrap that up well, but that that was my thinking around it. And and in in hearing some of the other concerns or debate in writing was around can it can it be inclusive? or at least acknowledge that there may be multiple voices that we need to hear to test our own assessment, the validity of our achieving our mission. Does that help you, David? Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to comment? Please come forward. Hi, Zoe Vallette, she, her. Uh, I feel like we are doing a bunch of wordsmithing to do our privileged white people tiptoeing around and we are saying all lives matter. We are not saying black lives matter when we make these changes. We are modifying our words in a very polite, meek, white people way to just, you know, ignore racism and give us a polite way to just kind of step around it. You know, we didn't say it, did we? We just stepped around it. So honestly, I have problems with all of the proposed amendments because they are all changing our words to all lives matter. That has comment. I would like to make sure that they have the opportunity. Anyone on Zoom read? No one on Zoom. We'll go to Greg and then to Carolyn. And again, at the moment we're discussing the proposed amendment to Article Two. Uh, I'm Greg Feldmeyer. Uh, I was thinking that perhaps we could use both. And I'm sorry, I, uh, Greg Feldmeyer. Uh, I was thinking that we could use both, informed by and be centered on the living de lived experiences. Um, uh, they're not exclusive. Um, you, you would have to do that as a different amendment after we d decide on this one. Okay. <laughs> so in other words, if, if this goes down and it's not approved, you would make an, um, you would stand up and pro, uh, propose adding the words. If it is uh, not approved, you would get up and propose adding the other words. All right. Okay. 
So hold that okay. thought, I'll Greg. That let's thought. let's see how this part turns out, and then go from there. Carolyn, see, and then Nikki has. Carolyn Heinemann again, um, to shift to, I'm gonna um, ride on the energy of Joe, Zoe's comment, to shift from centered on to informed by decreases our commitment. It puts it in the category of listening to those members of oppressed groups, and deciding whether we think their comments, their experience, their needs are good enough for us to act on or not good enough for us to act on. When we make the commitment that as one of the articles that Rochelle posted for us, in there it says what that results in is the least informed, the least knowledgeable, I think is the language in that article. The least knowledgeable group, those with privilege, having the most power to decide what to listen to and what not to listen to. By saying centering on, we make the commitment that when an oppressed group along the lines of any oppression says, this is our experience, this is how we are harmed, this is what we have to live with, that we make the deep commitment to say that is truth without just saying, oh gosh, that's just one opinion. That's the difference between informed by and centered on. Okay. Nikki? I'm not sure what my thoughts are or what I want to say, but at this point, I'm truly confused as to the difference between a bylaw and a policy. Um, I, I feel like they're getting intermingled here. Our, our bylaw is commitment to equity. And I, but I feel like we're getting into how we're going to be doing that, which is like policy. But also, I come from oppression. I don't come from racist oppression. Challenging ourselves to move forward a little bit farther into the discussion. Is there any other comment on the specific 
amendment that's put forward to change centered on to informed by. She would like to withdraw the amendment. No, she can't at this point. We are told that we can't withdraw it at this time. All right, so those in favor of amending Article 3, Section 2, to remove centered on and replace it with informed by, please raise your voting card. You are in favor of changing centered on to informed by. I only get seven. Okay. Yeah. All right. You can put your cards down, please. Those who are not in favor of changing centered on to informed by, please raise your voting cards. Yes. Thank you. Put your cards down, please. So where's my statement? There being more than half a 50% vote to keep the language as presented by the bylaws committee, it will stay as written. I probably didn't say that right, but I think we all know what I mean, right? Greg, did you still want to put forward your amendment? Right. So the new amendment would insert informed by, so it would read actions will be informed by and centered on. Is there any further need? Have we already addressed the conversation? Are we ready to just go to a vote? Is there a second? Got a second. Thank you. Bob. Is there a need for any further conversation or can we go directly to vote? There being no comment, those in favor of the amendment to insert informed by Damn. and be centered on. She's coaching me. She, they're in, inserting informed by and. To insert informed by and and then it will continue with be centered on. Raise your voting card. That's what I got. Okay. We counted 33 in favor. Those opposed to inserting informed by and, please raise your voting card. I get 24. There's not, we've got seven. There's a vote of 33 in favor and 22 opposed. We have 74 attending voting members. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter? The 33 is more than the 22. All right, she tells me that 33 is more than 22 and that we can move forward. I can do basic math, I promise. <laughs> so that means it's a second, right? The others are considered to not vote, but it's the majority of those present and voting. Mm -hmm. Now we come to 10. Yeah, but half of the number of voting is 37. So we don't actually have a majority. 
No, but it's the vote is the majority of those present and voting. And oh, okay, I got it. I got it. I get it now. I get it now. So I told you I wasn't going to be perfect at this. So we did insert. Yes. I'm finding my. All right. So more than 50% of the people who voted approved this and therefore the change goes into effect so that this will read, uh, our actions will be informed by and be centered on. Informed by and centered on. Yes, informed by and centered on. So Denise, do you have that? Thank you. All right. At this time, I'd like to close any discussion about Article 3, Section 1 and Article 3, Section 2. Is there an objection to that? All right. So before we move into this next piece, Savannah, would you? I invite everyone to just take a breath maybe stand up for a second and stretch. Honestly, I think we are doing very well on time and I appreciate your patience and staying with this. But please come back quickly. Yeah. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out love. Then I'll breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I'll breathe out If we could please have everybody return to the commons for the next piece of business. And read if you would kindly, read if you would kindly advance the slide to the amendment put forward by Tim. Which uh, would add a section three. The next one. Oh, shoot. I have to sincerely apologize because I was advised that there are people who have made comments in the chat. And I, I can't read them from here and I'm not logged in on my screen. So, um, no, the chat was about church administrators. So I don't know if that was relevant okay. to the topic at the moment. Okay. Yes, church administrator is has not been part of the conversation as of as of yet. Do we have our voting members back in the room, please? Of course there is. Of course there is. Okay, so maybe my timing was off. Maybe that wasn't the greatest place to take a breath. <laughs> but um, I could sing and dance. So I think if you've got another piece that you can fill for us, appreciate your patience with this. Again, you know, we're trying to do an in-person and an online presence, um, which I've never done before in this context. So thank you for your patience and your attention. 
And I'm going to let these ladies play us a There's a seed of hope in my soul, a little seed of hope in my soul. Gonna tend it every day so that it grows strong, all oh, this I pray. Then that seed of hope soon will bloom in my soul. There's a seed of joy in my soul a little seed of joy in my soul gonna tend it every day so that it grows strong all oh, this i pray then that seed of joy soon will bloom in my soul next one's peace there's a seed of peace in my soul a little seed of peace in my soul gonna tend it every day so that it grows strong all oh, this i pray then that seed of peace soon will bloom in my soul that's that's the last one <laughs> who's got a seed who's got a seed we want to sing about do we have time for that probably looks like it justice whatever there's a seed of justice in my soul a little seed of justice in my soul gonna tend it every day so that it grows strong all oh, this i pray then that seed of justice soon will bloom in my soul we have other seeds I don't think, there we go. Thank you to Savannah and uh, Jennifer for filling in for us for just a minute while we had a chance to take a little bit of a stretch and a break. And I would remind those of you that are on Zoom, if you would like to be highlighted in order to make a comment to please use the raise hand feature in Zoom so that it's very clear to read that you would like to speak on the topic that's being presented. Again, that's that was the best way we could figure out to let the people on Zoom at least be able to have a voice in the conversation, even though unfortunately at this time, we can't allow them to actually participate in the vote. So, so with that, I'd like to invite Tim Bardick to come forward as he has a proposed amendment to discuss with us and read if you could flip to the screen that has Tim's I think it's the next one. Yes. Read. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So before I before I formally propose the amendment, let me just state it. Um, it's to at the end of Article Three, <clears throat> add the following new subsection, three point three. Nothing in Article Three shall be construed as restricting the freedom of individual church members or the church as a whole to engage in constructive debate or to reach their own judges, judgments and decisions accountable to their own consciences. So let me cover some high points of why I think this amendment's needed. Um, so I have serious concerns that Article 3, as it's currently worded, is open to interpretations that are simply incompatible with people's church being a liberal church, a free church, in which church members, individual church members, as well as the church as a whole, are free to reach their own judgments and decisions after open debate. So there are a number of things in Article 3 that raise those concerns, but I guess my biggest concern comes from the word accountably 
in the proposed Article 3. So, you know, the language is, this is the language of the article. Uh, we affirm the need to dismantle all forms of oppression and commit to changing ourselves, our organization, and our society by building an environmentally just, wholly diverse, multicultural, beloved community that accountably dismantles racism and all forms of oppression. Accountably dismantles racism and all forms of oppression. So I think what church members need to understand uh, is that in UU anti-racism circles, accountability has some special meanings. It may not correspond to what you think the word means. And, uh, and those special meanings imply that UU groups should have their judgments and decisions be vetted by particular smaller groups and that the judgments of those smaller groups should not really be debated by the larger group. So for example, within the UUA, there is a proposal to add an eighth principle or a current seven principles. I think a lot of people are aware of that, some people may not be, but in any event, the uh, proposed bylaws very closely resemble the proposed eighth principle. It's not identical, very similar. And the, there's a group promoting the eighth principle. They have a website and they've been admirably clear about what they mean by accountability. What it means is that UU groups, and I'm quoting them here, should have a people of color caucus. And that people of color caucus is intended to be a quote, effective mechanism to quote, make sure whites do what they say they will do. So, you know, in my opinion, this whole accountability approach is just simply incompatible with the church being a, a free and liberal church, which respects the consciences, the individual consciences of church members, and in which the church, as we're doing today, uh, comes, we collectively come to our uh, own collective judgments and decisions about how best to move forward after some thoughtful discernment. Now, I would certainly say that thoughtful discernment includes listening to diverse groups. Listening. Listening is not at all the same as accountability to some group, and I don't care who is in the group. Ultimately, freedom of conscience requires that people in the church and the church as a whole make their own judgments about what actions to take. Now, you know, since there have already been some remarks made that listening is not enough, I certainly think we should listen to groups involved in a prop. So to take one example, if we're trying to deal with the problem of long-term unemployment, we certainly should talk to the long-term unemployed about what long-term unemployment does to substance abuse, what it does to family breakups, how it affects someone's life, what it does to them. And we would be fools not to listen to their knowledge of their situation. But does that mean that if a long-term group of long-term unemployed say, well, therefore we think fiscal and monetary policy should do this, this is what the job training program should be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we should simply say, okay, they've said it, what this is, this is the policy should be followed. That doesn't make any sense. Because if you're making policy in the real world, we need to deal with a lot of complex social factors and we need to listen to the group involved, get their expertise on their situation, but social change is difficult. It requires dealing with a lot of complex aspects of society. In the end, we have to make our own judgment about what course of action is best. Now, so I already said what you groups sometimes mean by accountability. What does the bylaws committee of this church mean by the accountability language? Well, they also helpfully provided a document online that, uh, in which they talked about how they responded to feedback. And I thought that, that you know, they, they were pretty straightforward about what they meant. And uh, I think it raises concerns that in many cases, accountability amounts to a creed. So for example, the committee refers to a document that I think a lot of people have seen. It's been circulated at different church committees that's called an anti-racism rubric for UU congregations. 
So that document, uh, according to the bylaws committee, they said it was developed by UU Black Indigenous People of Color leaders. So as an example of accountability, the bylaws committee documents that states about the rubric, and I'm quoting here, we will not dismiss debate or minimize any aspect of the rubric as unimportant or ill-informed. So I repeat, we will not debate any aspect of the rubric. If we don't allow for debates, if we don't allow for debates, that document essentially becomes an creed being imposed on people's church. It's a violation of a bond union, which states we base our, our, our union upon no creed test. And the bond union goes on to say, and I quote, we welcome all, we welcome all who wish to join us to help establish truth, righteousness, and love in all the world. Okay, welcoming all is just a bunch of words that means nothing. It's meaningless if it does not include welcoming people who may disagree with some or all of a rubric. It's meaningless if it doesn't include those who may disagree with one particular approach to anti-racism work. So the purpose of my amendment is to prevent what I see as pretty problematic interpretation of accountability from being imposed by, this, by these bylaws as what amounts to a creed test for church members, one that only welcomes church members who agree with one particular ideology for how to engage in anti-racism work. And by the way, I would say, if that's your ideology, fine. Okay? I think people should be free to have a variety of ideas about how we actually go about achieving uh, truth, righteousness, and love in all the world. There's plenty of that to work on, different means to a similar end. But if we're not going to, if we're only going to welcome people who agree with a particular ideology of how to do this, we have a serious problem. So um, I'd like to formally move the adoption of my amendment, which just to restate it is, at the end of Article 3, add the following new subsection. Nothing in Article 3 shall be construed as restricting the freedom of individual church members or the church as a whole to engage in constructive debate or to reach their own judgments and decisions accountable to their own consciences. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Is there a second? There's lots of seconds. Did you get a hand? I'm sorry, I can't. Okay, you're only looking at the top part. The also proposed was not put forward as a formal amendment at this time. So we're only discussing right now the top part of the screen. Thank you, Bob. Did you get a name, Denise? Okay, so as you can imagine, there's been a lot of discussion. There's been online, there's been videos, there's been recommendations, some of it put forward just in the last couple of weeks as people came closer to engaging in this conversation. I'm going to remind us that our vision and mission have already committed us to equity work. How do we phrase it here to make it part of our guiding document? So now at this time, if you would like to make comment regarding the proposal as it's shown on the screen, I invite you as individual members to come forward and do that. And this is a conversation from individual members. 
So Rochelle, then David, then Brian. And it looks like we might have somebody online too. I think for the purposes of speaking, that's acceptable. There's a, a pandemic of weak knees and shaky body parts this morning. Following Tim Bartik does that for me. Um, I just wanted to explain why I commented uh, in our documents about the amendment and to clarify, um, to clarify that this morning. I think it's really helpful to remember that these are our policy or our bylaws and not our policy documents. And so I wanted to just say that um, I have great faith in our congregation and in our boards over and over again, um, you know, and in us as individuals to, to do the work that we need to do without compromising the principles that we hold dear. And I don't take lightly at all this concern about our, our right of conscience and wrote about that in my comments as well. What my concern is, is that um, it's really, I think, important for us to aspire that the language that we use here to follow our board's leadership and our congregation's affirmation toward the mission and vision that we've identified, that the things that we write in our bylaws are affirmative and aspirational in the direction that we wish to go. So much, in my opinion, of anti-racism uh, compromise and what happens that makes it ineffective is that we do use uh, words, as Zoe pointed out, that allows us to bypass. And I have, I have no concern that that was the intention of the wording here. I worry about how it will be interpreted, used, and um, allow us to evade the work that we've committed ourselves to. And so for that reason, uh, and because I, I trust us, and I know that we have local polity, so we are not you know, victims, if you will, of, of UUA decisions in that sense. And I believe that we can develop sensible, wise policy statements to help us implement this article and all of these articles. I would prefer that we affirm the way in which we will do this that does uh, follow our bond of union, as Tim pointed out, and the principles of the UUA. If we need to articulate that, as has been suggested here, I think that's certainly uh, valuable and important to do so that no one mistakes that we are substituting a new creed test. But I stand by the work of the bylaw committee in understanding what the intention is and the need for us to affirm that. And so I speak against uh, the amendment for the, by for the bylaw uh, and I'm certainly open to considering uh, an alternative that protects our right of consciousness, conscience and so forth. Thank you. All right, on my list, I had David and then Brian. Is there someone else that would like to speak? I'm sorry, I, uh, Rachel. And we had someone online. So after Brian, we'll go to Zoom and then we'll go to Rachel. Yes. Tom, you'd also like to be in that list, okay. All right, so David. Yes, I'm shaky as well. <laughs> uh, I just want to passionately support uh, Tim's amendment and uh, the argument he made in support of it. It strikes me that this is in the broad uh, and deep uh, understanding that we have as US citizens of the First Amendment. And uh, one of my favorite uh, documents uh, that has thinking like this is John Stewart's Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, 
which include the main point of that, and my understanding of the First Amendment as well, uh, is that we really need to be as open as possible to thoughts that might be different from ours, wherever they come from. And in this church, now and again, I'd like to hear a voice of principled conservatism. The C word seems to be something that many of us cannot understand or approve of. And, that, that's, and that's, um, that's too bad because not the people who call themselves conservatives now that identify with the Republican, most of the Republican Party. I'm not talking about them at all. Um, we could get into a long debate about this, but now and again, I'm one of those people and I'm timid about it and I shouldn't be. Um, so I, the spirit of Tim's amendment, I, I couldn't agree with it more. Brian. My name is um, Brian Lewis, a member of People since August of 2017. We must understand that justice is a practice and not an end. Uh, Eddie Gloud said that. Another Unitarian church as their mission, empowered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. Now, the eighth principle that Tim mentioned that the UUA is working on is known as the Article II Study Commission. The words of the eighth principle has been a very long, long process. And I have been involved in attending the Zoom meetings for over two years. And I have seen this kind of thing repeat itself in the stories of other denominations. Typically, we do a lot of this talking and then thank God at the end, there's only two or three or four people that support these amendments. And so we kind of pass it and we, we move on. But others, we do have some risk on that. Um, now the Article II Study Commission is basically the seven principles as we know but we haven't changed those since 1985. And um, just to point out, just, just to point out that seven principles is not a solid thing. They could become five principles. We could do something in that regard. Now, just to quickly remind people what the eighth principle says, just, just to quickly do it. We covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community. The key beloved community is important by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institution. Now, why does, why does that matter? The reason it matters is there's a lot we don't know we don't know. For example, in our own UU world, Black history, 1968, 1985, 2003, today. Well, maybe a lot of us will remember 1968 because we remember the bridge. We remember that it was that church in that town that provided refuge after people were beat up trying to cross that bridge. And as a result, that triggered some stuff in the UU world to really start to realize we got a problem with not recognizing the fact that we're all white in the Unitarian world. 1985, we started funding things for supporting black and people of color in our UU world. But in 1985, we had a recession and it was actually 83, but the point is in 85, we cut some programs and budgeting that were promoting and supporting this understanding, keyword, understanding, 
we are all white, mostly in this room. Some of us may identify uh, with Native American or whatever, but the point is, the, the important point is, the second you in the Unitarian Universalist is universal love. Now our principles cover that stuff in one through seven, but we're not really accountable as per what I'm trying to point out here. Um, okay, I guess that part's done. So this part's next. Um, I'm about maybe one or two more minutes. Just for giggles, do people realize in Ukraine that there's an African Ukrainian problem that's developed in the last couple of days? Just please raise your hand if you know what the heck I'm talking about. The point is nobody's going to. And that's why, even though I respect what Tim's trying to do, we cannot remove the accountable because there is an apparent situation where the black people are not being allowed to get on these trains to escape, not even to cross the borders. We're talking the families, the women, the children. Um, so there it is. You can look it up and confirm it. Uh, Africans in Ukraine on Twitter. So the point I'm gonna end with is, yeah, race is artificial. It's been talked about today. Uh, but it uh, artificial in the sense of science and chemistry, but it's a reality. And the word accountable needs to be in this document for three reasons. White privilege is wordsmithing all this stuff. Number two, we haven't been accountable. And we need to be somehow accountable. And four, three, when I talked about the uni you and universalism, it's about uh, love, uh, the ability to um, not be turned down from other churches, et cetera, et cetera, universal love. In order to have that, we have to leave the language as it is and understand that our universal aspect does not tie us like people are arguing in this room because of the word accountable. Mm -hmm. We are still free to make our own choices. Thank you. Oh, thank I guess it's clear I'm not in favor of the amendment. Right. So thank you. But again, to, to clarify, the motion is not to remove the word accountability from the language that we've already discussed. It's to add a clarifying section to Article three, but thank you for that. So the next on my list, I, I just have a note that says Zoom. So Reed, if you can help us with, um, with our Zoom partners. Okay, this is coming from, this is probably better. This is coming off of chat, so please forgive the person's use of participles and et cetera, because it's chat. This is coming from Adham Tayera. And I hear some giggles, okay. The, uh, the comment is, I think the group should be black and white working together to avoid, to use discrimination against the wrong racism. Could harm, discrimination against the wrong racism could harm against them should have freedom to church to make a good decision. Okay. So maybe someone can expand on that. I think we'll let it stand as it's presented. Is there anyone through the video, anyone else? Nope. So we'll move to the next person. Thank you for being mindful of who's next and you know moving as quickly as we can. Hello, I'm Rachel Bear. Um, I just wrote a speech. <laughs> um, 
I want to thank our, our friend Tim for bringing this forward. I, I do think the concerns about individual freedom of thought and the closeness to a creed are valid um, linguistically and, and philosophically. Um, and, but especially in the context of anti-racism and anti-oppression work, freedom of thought is critical as we all help each other along the journey. None of us can be compelled to defy centuries of status quo and our own lifetimes of um, learned experience without doing our own labor. And part of the work of this church is to make a loving space for us each to do that together. Um, what concerns me in the proposed um, amendment is that it conflates this individual work with the work of our congregation. The process of defining our bylaws, this we are doing right here, right now, um, and what we delegated to our informed colleagues on the committee over the last three years is our church as a whole engaging in constructive debate, debate and reaching a decision as a group. We are, this is where I started scribbling. <laughs> Okay, um, this is our process of, of coming to our own judgments and decisions. And we are through this process choosing to make ourselves accountable to marginalized people and especially people of color over our own collective consciousness or as consciences or as our collective consciences. Um, so like Rochelle stated, I trust us as a group um, to build policies around this bylaws that will not betray our basic principle of freedom of thought. Um, but if we do feel we specifically need to define in our bylaws, our principle of our individual freedom of thought, um, and tell me if I have this process right, Barb, um, I will move, if this amendment passes, I will move an amendment to the amendment to strike our or the church as a whole from it, because I feel this is an amendment that defines our individual um, responsibility for our own thought and action, whereas the entire process of writing the bylaws is our church's responsibility. Um, so again, as individuals, we are accountable to ourselves and our own consciences, um, but we as a loving congregation are now choosing to make ourselves accountable to other people who have marginalized identities. And I think I said everything I wrote down, so thank you. Thank you, so as a point of order, I think it will be more clear if we make the decision about whether to accept the amendment as written or not written before we go into modifications to what's presented. I think that would be easier for everybody to keep track of. Does that make sense? All right, so Tom. Well, uh, I think that what Tim has written is probably at the root of why every one of us in here has joined a UU church. That freedom of conscience is a deep, deep part of this. Uh, to specifically place it in this article regarding oppression and racism, I think allows a uh, backing away from a commitment that Article 3 is really talking about. So uh, I, I oppose putting the amendment here, but I would uh, encourage some form of it to be a part of Article 4 about membership, that we all have a responsibility to speak our conscience, to think independently, and bring forward our own thoughts. So um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm opposed to it in this location, but thank you, Tim, for bringing to uh, the table uh, that we all have that responsibility as members of this church. 
Thank you. Nikki. And then I see Carolyn. Um, I'm going to speak in support of the amendment. Article three is where we originally said that there is basically no test of creed or race or of anything um, as a condition of membership. And that was completely taken away and replaced with um, building the beloved community um, and dismantling racism and all forms of oppression. And by putting this amendment back in, we're going back to saying that there is no test of membership and that you can come here with your own consciousness and thoughts. And so I think it is an appropriate place for this amendment to be. And Carolyn. Carolyn Heinemann. The bylaws committee was indeed very aware of the language of no creed test. It was not taken out of the bylaws. It is in article two. I'm going to speak essentially in opposition to this amendment by just talking about history in four waves. Wave one in the 60s, the BIPOC members of Unitarian Universalism nationwide gathered together, rose up, and challenged the nationwide community to hear their concerns to hear how they are harmed and excluded by what we think is right action and right being and right relationship. The UUA and those in power pledged money, as Brian mentioned, and action to address those concerns. And nationwide, UUs found a loophole to not do that. They didn't follow through on their promises. In the 90s, many BIPOC individuals, by the way, left the UU community at the end of that wave. Frequently in this church, I hear, why aren't there more BIPOC members of our community? So as you reflect, if you do on that question, also think about this history. In the 90s, the BIPOC community with a new Unitarian Universalism nationwide gathered together, rose their voice and said to all of us, we are not okay here. We don't feel safe. You're not addressing our concerns. We feel excluded and demeaned and we need action. We need you to do something. And nationwide at General Assembly and in the UUA, everybody nodded and said, yes, you're right and plans started being made. And then a loophole was found and we didn't do that work. And more BIPOC individuals left our spiritual community. In 2003, BIPOC community nationwide and Unitarian Universalism rose. I'm starting to shake because I feel the pain of this. And it really, really bothers me rose up and said twice, you have said you've listened to us and you've made promises and you're gonna allocate funds, you're gonna allocate committees, you're gonna talk, you're gonna resolve, you're gonna change things so that we feel like this is our beloved community as well as yours. And you know what happened? They found a loophole. They didn't follow through. They didn't change anything. And now for the last, I don't know, Brian, how many years, 
the BIPOC community nationwide and Unitarian Universally has been standing up and saying, we are in pain. Within this community that you call beloved, we do not feel beloved. We do not feel heard. We do not feel like our pain is being addressed or even seen. And now nationwide, UUA, 153 congregations now have adopted the eighth principle. Everyone's saying, we get it. We hear your pain. We see your pain. It matters to us. We're going to do something about it. And so here we are in the fourth wave. And the BIPOC community is sitting back, waiting for us to find the loophole. Again, this is a loophole. I do not have anyone further on my list that wanted to make comment. Apparently we have someone else who would like to make comment. Perfect. Sorry, thank you. That's, not, <laughs> that's what we're here for. Um, I would echo what a lot of other folks have said. And I, I also just wanna say that it's time that we, start being accountable to anyone but ourselves and our own consciousness, consciences, because our consciences have been shaped by our culture. And like others have said, there's things that we don't know, we don't know. So I'm speaking against this amendment. Thanks. Okay. So I would like to remind the congregation that whatever the result is here today, that this is a living document, and this does not have to be the only conversation about this piece. I would suggest that we come to some form of move forward so that we are prepared to go into the May 2022 meeting under our new document. But with that said, Are we ready to vote? I'm seeing nods. Those in favor of accepting the amendment to add section three, as shown on the screen, to article three, again, in favor, please raise your voting card. I get 23. I get 20. Those against adding section three, please raise your voting cards. I got 35. So there were 20, either 22 or 23 in favor <laughs> and either 35 or 36 against. <laughs> so in, in that case, the amendment as shown is not at this time added to the bylaws document. Thank you for a very productive and thoughtful conversation and please let's not have this be the only conversation. Let's continue this work as we continue to evolve. So to, to my knowledge, that was all the amendments that were going to be made. Then why don't you come on up, Pat? She's not sure if it's an amendment or not, so we'll hear what she has to say and then we'll figure it out. So Pat Nelson, I, um, I want to, want to say is that I, I was so surprised by people I talked to recently about their reactions, varied reactions to this article. And uh, it made me think about what other people were thinking that I hadn't heard from, and also for myself to look at this article more carefully. 
And I know we don't want to go in details here, but I do want to know what we're committing ourselves to. And when it says that we're going to, you know, center our reflections on the lived experience of people um, who feel marginalized, I, I, what do we, how would we do that? What, what does that mean? Um, I just would love to have. I feel like you know the, the bylaws committee has done such a heroic job. I, I just hate to say this, but I really feel like the COVID experience has not been conducive to our having the person-to-person -person small group meetings that are really needed for the significance of this. We can tell by the passion of people that have come up here on both sides. Um, I would like to know it's if this is a point of inquiry. I was trying to, you know, um, no, that's all right. Is there a way? Um, what I would like to do is have more, have more small group meetings. And what I would hope is that we could do that for, by the May meeting and have a resolution of this article. And I don't know if that means that we would have to reject this article or could we accept the rest without accepting this and just make it a postponement or tell me please what would be the proper thing to do. So one of the things that we want to be able to do at the end of this meeting is to release the bylaws committee from having to continue this work, right? Because they've been doing it for us for a very long time. So, so I think my recommendation would be how we define lived experience can really be part of policy. So I'm completely in favor of doing the small group discussions, right? between now and May with either one of two results, either an additional amendment to this article or to address in in policy. Yeah, I guess I would like, I think a few people have kind of suggested that we put the bylaws out and then we, you know, adjust it with policy, but the bylaws are the center. The bylaws mm -hmm. are the aim. Uh, policy comes later. I would like what we really want to do to be clearly stated in this article. So are you saying, Susan, that I, I would hate to, um, I don't want I don't want to accept and then revise. I, I would rather, uh, is there a way, you know, besides rejecting the article and then reproposing it for the rest of the articles? I don't know what you mean when you say, are you saying that we can't postpone this discussion without and then and also release the bylaws committee? Help me out, Barb. I think I understand it, but okay. If if what you want to, if your question is about how would we actually do this, how would we structure this, and in the details, that is a policy and procedures question. No, I'm asking about how do we to have discussions without accepting this today. If if you don't want to take this as the guidepost for, because the board would have to work within this structure to have those small groups and to have develop that policy, okay? If you don't put this in, in other words, don't approve this article, then it just will not be in the bylaws at the end of this. And the other bylaws that are proposed today could be accepted and so that we can go ahead with our meeting in May under the right. new rules. And, okay. And then you could propose okay. an okay. alternate okay. additional article covering okay. this. Okay, so that would be the way to for the okay. So meeting. as much as I, you know, it's really embarrassing to stand up here and, and seem to be anti-equity, but I, I just really feel like we need more. Uh, I want an exchange. You know, somebody giving you a lot of information about, you know, how they view it is one thing, but I want an exchange. I like to kick these ideas around and have a sense of, of community about this. So um, I don't wanna drop this. I don't wanna dismiss the great work of the bylaws committee, but if it, I, I think I had the impression before, but I wasn't sure. So I, I would vote to um, reject this particular article with the intention certainly of picking it up and hopefully having, I would, I would help in any way I can. Um, I would like to talk about this more before we make this very, very substantive yes. decision. Thank you. All right, so I think we are to the point, and Pat has done a beautiful job of leading into it, is any discussion about the article as a whole 
before the article is put to a vote by the congregation. So Bob, is there anyone else that has not already said what they wanna say that would like to make a final comment? Are we still describing the article, proposed amendment to article three, new section three that's displayed? No, the article three, section three as displayed has been voted down. So we are now discussing the acceptance of article three as a whole with the accepted amendment of sections one and two of sections one and two with two having been kept in its full form right and added in and section two adding informed by okay so, so the discussion is over the article as a whole okay so not, we don't have a powerpoint for that we no. do not okay cool <laughs> I'm Bob Davis. Denise is uh, writing it all I would down like for us. To, to second Pat's comments. I think it's listening to the discussion in this room. I do not think we have a consensus on what we should be doing moving forward. And I don't think that this is the appropriate place in the bylaws for this kind of topic. I think the bylaws is strictly something that should be how we uh, vote and the membership and things like that, basic stuff and things like this that we're still evolving, that we're still trying to figure out, really should not be solidified into this document at this time. A better approach would be at the congregational meeting to have a proposal of point of order or something to, to, to guide uh, the, the board at that time in working on the anti-racism work to have more details and to have everybody in this room agree and reach to the point where it's not going to be a vote of 30 to 20 or something like that, but rather, a unanimous uh, vote and a consensus that we're ready to move forward. I think this topic is too important to move forward without a consensus. And I favor uh, voting down this amendment, but returning not as a bylaws amendment, but as a proposal for the board. Any final comment about the article as a whole? Carolyn and Sherry, did you? Uh, Carolyn Heineman again. Um, I am in support of including this in the bylaws and passing it now. I really resonate with Pat's comments that interaction discussion, learning has to happen. There will be thousands of conversations over the next two, three, four decades about this. What does it mean? What criteria? What actions? How do we talk within ourselves, with people outside of our four walls who have experience in this, who have tried to do it in their congregations, nonprofits, uh, the library, People's Food Co-op, KRISA, are all working on this. And they are having hard conversations, really long conversations, and many, many conversations. The how do we pull this off is not known. We have to create that among ourselves. And I am so totally on board with many, many, many small group, large group conversations about this. And I think it's time to lay down a commitment that we will enter those conversations. We will look each other in the eye and we will do the hard work. That's the only change I've made now. Sherry? 
My feeling is that the way this uh, Article 3 is written is the general framework of our commitment to equity and that the details will be in the policy and that all these conversations we need to make will help us help the board form the policy. But I believe we should uh, pass this along with the rest, rest of the um, bylaws today. Thank you. So with that, are we ready to vote? Oh, somebody's pointing. Is there a, a hand up? Ah, okay, come on. Thank you, Elizabeth Warner. I'm thinking about Brian Stevenson and his work and helping people think in um, privileged settings about getting proximate and being okay being uncomfortable. And this is the time for us to step up and say, it's gonna be uncomfortable, I don't get it completely, and we're gonna learn our way there together. And so I would, in, in favor of this article being accepted and passed and learning our way together. Again, are we ready to vote? All right, so the vote is on Article 3 in its totality with the amendment to insert informed by and in Section 2. Are we clear? We, we weren't able to figure out how to make it show live. <laughs> All in favor? Please raise your voting cards. I get 44. Those opposed. I see 11. 11. 11. All right, so the results are 44 in favor and 11 against. So with that, Article 3, with the amendment to Section 2, is approved. Again, as the president of your board, please feel free to continue with this conversation in your committees presentations to prepare for the May meeting. And as we develop policies and practices, we would certainly appreciate your input on these issues. Is Savannah still here? <laughs> she had to go. All right. So we're gonna pretend that we just sang when I breathe in. <laughs> okay. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. So thank you again for your patience and staying here for this very important work. To my knowledge, the next section, section four, also has um, going to have some conversation around it. And then hopefully the rest of the questions will go very quickly because I'm going to anticipate that they're probably just clarifications. So so section four for membership, there were commentary submitted to the board in advance. There was not a formal draft of an amendment put forward at that time. So if there is a formal amendment to Section four, that will have to be stated here, you know, for the first time. So is there anyone who would like to have discussion about article four or has a question on article four, section one? Read online. Okay. Is there any discussion that is wanted or proposed amendment to section two. All 
Why don't you bring that forward, please? Is it on? Uh, Pat Van Slambert. I'd like to have it explained how uh, six weeks was determined. And I assume that uh, that means six consecutive weeks. Uh, does it mean six um, services? Uh, just like to have an explanation background on that. I'm sorry, which, which section? Section you're two? You're talking about two, where a person um, has the right to vote if they have been a member for six weeks, right? Go ahead, Barb. This is less than the current bylaws. The current bylaws say two months. Okay. Um, a few years ago, I don't remember exactly when now, there was a proposal to make the uh, length of time 30 days. So the bylaws committee kind of compromised and took the middle. And then we thought, do we want to say a specific number of days or would it be appropriate more appropriate to say weeks because yes, usually we have meetings on a Sunday and people are in church on Sunday. And if they wanna sign the bond of union, they could sign it on a Sunday. And so, yes, we said 42 days or six weeks as a compromise between uh, the current 60 days and what was earlier discussed about 30 days. And we had quite a long discussion about this. So in some ways it's kind of arbitrary, but in other ways uh, we do, uh, you know, one possibility is say, you know, you could walk in now and sign the bond of union and vote. And we haven't had that tradition in our church. So does this, is this an, enough explanation, Pat? Any other questions on Article 4, Section 2, or proposed amendment? I'm getting a no from Reed. All right. Is there any discussion that is wanted or potential amendment to Article 4, Section 3? Reed? Seeing none. All right, so I'm gonna guess, take a wild one, but the discussion we wanna have is about Article 4, Section 4, and any potential amendments. So I know Nikki, can I get some hands of people who might want to speak to this article? Come on up, Nikki. Again, this is covered in what I wrote up and um, it's in your packet. So it's just really reviewing that here, um, but uh, 4B uh, is the where I'm objecting. And um, if a person is violent, harassing, a real problem, I understand inviting them to leave the premises and removing um, the violence that way. But to actually then drop the person from the roles of membership is what I'm having a problem with. I don't feel that I can make that decision. I didn't make the decision for the person to become a member. And it's not up to me to decide that they don't belong as a member to the church. And what I say in my write-up is that if you believe in the intrinsic worth and dignity of every individual, 
they can be having a problem. They, they can be violent. They can be under mental stress. We don't necessarily know all the circumstances and they need help. But if I treat them with worth and dignity, then I give them the help they need and I don't kick them out. And that was my problem with the wording here that we could actually remove an active member of our congregation from the membership roles. Um, as I said, I understand removing them physically, but not from the membership roles. So Nikki, is there a specific amendment oh, so, that you would like to put forward? Um, I, I, I just would like, I guess I, not, I, 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 it would be B, I'm not sure how to word that. It would, um, the members who harass, threaten, or criminally act against, et cetera, may be subject to removal um, after, but not at, at C, concurrent with, it's, you, it's only in C that you talk about the removal of the membership. In B, you're talking about the removal um, from the church property. It doesn't say removal from membership. So I'm not sure um, where we actually. Um, removal. Removal means removal from membership. Then I would want to change that. Um, it may be removed from the premises, but not from membership. And I would like to specifically say not from membership because our policy currently was changed to allow people to be removed from membership. And the explanation given at the meeting was since the bylaws don't stop the policy from happening, you can do it in the policy. So I really would like it to be that um, an active member can be removed from the pr premises, but not from the membership roles. We have a suggestion for how we might do that. Removal from the president from the property, if it's required, is actually a police action. Right. Okay. And so it's not addressed in our bylaws at all. That's oh, outside okay. of that. Okay. The whole question about it is that at this point. If we have, for instance, a, an order, uh, a restraining order against a member, they have a legal right to be here irrespective of that restraining order, even if the, you know, there's another person involved in that. So this was really suggested by our, when we did the legal review that we put this in there so that it was, you know, right now, because we use Robert's Rules of Order, as our parliamentary authority, there is a process to remove someone from membership and it takes, it would be from Robert's Rules of Order and there's like 20 pages of it in my little book about how to do it. I, I don't think a it. church should be based on a parliamentarian decision. That's right. All right. And so the membership in the church is different than a membership at a meeting, which is what Robert's Rules is talking it, about. Right. Precisely. So that is why the language is proposed in the bylaws so that it is of our church and reflective for okay. our church and, and, and that we're not reliant on falling back on okay. then I would just parliamentarian. I, then, I would just change the title and drop it and say members cannot active members cannot be removed from the membership roles because I, I just don't think that. But we're specifically talking about removing them from the membership roles in the case of harassment, threatening or criminal behavior, right. not because of inactivity or. But who am I moved. to. If, if we're an open, accepting church, then if you are have a mental problem or a criminal or mm -hmm. do, do I really want to say you can't be a member of this church? Okay. Then, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, but I'm, I'm, 
I'm struggling with exactly how to amend. Like, are By you basically taking it out and okay. saying, oh, but I would like to actually amend it to say that an active member cannot be removed from the roles because you've already changed the policy and I don't agree with the policy change. Okay. So would you like us to remove all of section four? I forget what that would. No, because I think inactive can still be, should be removed. If you, you know, if you've died, moved away, you're no longer an active member. That's why I'm saying active member of the church. Okay. So okay. essentially you're requesting to strike section B, B 2B, or are we on 2B? Right. 4B. 4B, yes. Okay, so. I and even C, because if a person's inactive, I don't think that you, um, oh yeah, I suppose you can tell them how they can become active again and reinstate, okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. So the motion is, is to, to strike removing section 4B. And it, it's more than that. It, the motion is to make 4B say we cannot remove active members from the membership roles because what you've already done is told me that you changed your policy because there's nothing in the bylaws that prevent you from doing it. Okay. I'm trying to prevent you from doing it. Okay. So then in that case, you need to be specific about okay. it being removing members for harassing, threatening, or criminally, because we've already concurred that we can remove due to inactivity. So we have to make sure that it's clear. Well, that's why I'm... When, I'm saying that active members cannot be removed. An active member being somebody who's actually coming to church, paying dues, being a volunteer. Oh, you're you're saying you you're already removing inactive, and I have no objections to removing inactive people. Why okay. do we want to keep people on for a thousand years when they're no, you know, they're dead and buried and moved away. All right. So, <laughs> so here's, so here's my understanding and you tell me if I'm right, that we're going to strike the current language of section 4B and replace it with active members cannot be removed from membership. Roles. Yeah. All right, so the amendment is to strike section B as written and replace it with the language active members may not be removed from membership roles. That's my understanding. Is there a second? We have a second. All right, uh, Lois. So, uh, we will open the conversation for comment on that amendment. Sherry? While uh, we were working on this article, or, or later, we um, had a, an attorney review this. We also brought it before a... Um, a uh, district level UUA person who deals with bylaws and both of them told us how important it was to have this available in the case it was needed to be able to remove someone from membership. But also along with it, and this is remove them for being interruptive of our process of our church and bothering other people. Part of it was the UUA person told us many congregations have found that not addressing inappropriate and destructive behavior 
causes ripple effects of members leaving because they don't want to put up with that. Well, you could say that could still be a member. When they're removed, they are given an opportunity to come back and to, to change their behavior. And um, also I had asked this person, can you give me some real examples, real life examples of when this was ever used and why you needed it? Uh, and I'd like to just say a couple. A member of the congregation brought and left a stun gun in the children's religious education area on a number of occasions, he interacted inappropriately with the children, stalking. He was removed from membership as he refused to change his behavior. So he was given a chance before removal. A member of the congregation who was their voluntary webmaster became disgruntled, posted inappropriate things on the congregation's website, refused to turn over the password, and would not resign. He was removed from membership. Another member of the congregation acted inappropriately with the children. Uh, they were removed from membership as they did not believe that what they did was wrong. Also, a member posted statements attacking members of the congregation for alleged wrongdoing that they were presumed to have happened because they were white and male. The member assumed that it meant that people were racist and sexist and homophobic. That person texted staff members over 30 times a day with demands and profanity. Copious emails they sent to members of the congregation. The person was removed from membership. They refused to be bound by the congregation's right relationship covenant. So those are just a few examples of things that really did happen. And the removal process was needed. So I, I feel that it's very important that we, we keep that and realize it's not a judgment against the person, it's protecting our congregation. Thank you. Connie, and then David. I end up with a few questions. I absolutely agree that someone who is behaving in a way that is of some risk or whatever to people in the building should be banned from the building and perhaps from other activities where people's people gather. I'm not quite clear about whether if we pull their membership pull their member that we have to pull their membership to ban them from the building and Barbara I think you were saying something about that perhaps the question is if they're a member uh -huh. they have a right to be in the building automatically there's no way we can work around that right so okay. it's a question of if if depending on what level the behavior rises to uh -huh. how do you ask that person to stop that behavior so if it rises to the point of being criminal when you involve the police then, you would involve then the police. that's a different but, story but the thing is that you don't really you know in in terms of i hope we never actually have ever have to yeah. use this yeah but the point from the legal advice that was given to the bylaws committee is that when the occasion arises, you need to have it ready. Mm -hmm. We hope that we'll never actually have to do this, but yeah. to say that you can't do it would mean that then we get into massive legal problems mm -hmm. and liability problems. So okay. we could perhaps address in policy more detail about when we might or might not use this. Right. Okay. And then a couple other things. Um, the, incidents you cited involving the web and emails and texts and so forth, removal from membership, it seems to me, wouldn't necessarily solve those. It separates us from that person, but it, I think they could still keep doing it. I don't know, but that's just something to consider. And the last thing is, to me anyway, 
our basis of membership relates to our bond of union. And it's, you can read it a lot of different ways. But anyway, that's something that should be perhaps part of the overall discussion. Thank you. David? Uh, this subject of conflict really struck a nerve with me, and I think maybe it struck a nerve with you too. Those of you who've been coming long enough to remember Davidson lore, um, I'm not quite clear, but from what I understand, he said a lot of things that angered a lot of people to a point where it split the church in half. That's what necessitated, necessitated the forming of the other UU church in Portage. Well, I think one threatening behavior is one person, I'm not going to mention this person's name, but he did say, and I quote, why did you insult my wife? And then he said, listen, I can get a contract on you. And, and Laura said, are you threatening my life? Well, and he said, well, what do you think? But, but I think by proposing this, this bylaw probably would be a good idea. Okay. Greg, and then Brian. Uh, Greg Feldmeyer. Um, in reading this- Lift the I, mic up, Greg. Uh, in reading this, uh, I see all the due process that would be required if someone was uh, inappropriate. Uh, they would be um, uh, have due process with an opportunity to appeal as specified in the policy manual, which will take some work. Uh, and then after removal, uh, they can be reinstated if they recover or whatever it is that caused the problem. So I, and I, not being a lawyer, but I think uh, we do need the protection. And uh, this uh, uh, begins that uh, protection after we, and needs to be finished with the policy um, manual. Brian. And I think everybody needs to stand in front of the stained glass window because it reflects on your shirt and it makes a really pretty, <laughs> <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> and Barb. Hi, I'm Brian Lewis again. I understand people, I think some people are concerned about the term membership. And to me, it's on paper versus what's in our heart and our head. And I would like to remind people if they're thinking that you're told you aren't Unitarian, I, I don't believe we're doing that here because we have the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And I agree with the part about the um, uh, inherent worth and dignity, of course. But anyway, I just wanna remind people, don't get too tripped up over the fact that they're being banished from the faith because they're not. There's the um, Church of the Wider Fellowship and there's the internal head and heart. I'm a Unitarian. and uh, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ann Chepik, and um, I could tell that this was something that was important to me when my pulse started racing. Um, the thought of somebody who was harassing or threatening me or my family not being able to be removed is terrifying. So um, I, like if I, to use Susan as an example, because I know she would never, um, if Susan was, you know, threatening my life, um, it would violate my right to be in a safe place. So um, yeah, I guess that's um, my biggest point. And I also wanna um, echo what Greg said about it does say that there is a due process in place. 
And, you know, and also what Brian said, uh, if you are a member in your head and your heart, um, are you acting in accordance with, you know, our, our values, if you are threatening and harassing people, are you truly a member of our faith in the UU church? Um, and I think that was it. I just wanted to really <laughs> speak my fear, you know, um, cause that is, that is very scary. Thank you. So again, the action that's before us right now is to decide if we are going to accept Nikki's amendment to strike the language in section B as it was proposed and to replace it with a statement that active members may not be removed from membership roles. Are we ready to make a decision about whether to accept or reject that amendment? I'm seeing nods. So those in favor of striking Section B, which is highlighted on the screen, and replacing it with the language, active members may not be removed from membership roles. If you are in favor of that, please raise your voting cards. If you are not in favor of that amendment, please raise your voting cards. Okay. We will not be amending Section B. Is there any other commentary on section four of article four, or are we ready to vote? You have a comment, Pat? All right, so I'll just ask that part. Are we ready to vote? All right, I lost my screen. So all those in favor of approving article four, in total, as presented by the bylaws committee, raise your voting card. Go ahead and put them down. Those not in favor of Article 4, okay. with more than a two thirds vote in favor, Article 4 is approved in total. Thank you again for expressing and being brave to express differences of opinion in this space, it is welcome. All right, so we'll move on to Article 5. Is there anyone that would like to have discussion, a question, or a potential amendment for Article 5, Section 1? Five in general. So Barb has suggested that I just pose it as the entire article. Is there what part hey, Nikki has comment? Anyone else have a comment or question? Be on my list. Come on up, Nikki. Can you tell us which section you would like to speak to? This is uh, 3D. 3D. Yeah, and it was really a question. It says an officer may be removed by a majority vote of the trustees then in office. This, and I just didn't know if there, it doesn't say for just cause, it doesn't say anything. So it sounded like any majority could decide to get rid of anybody. So I just wanted a clarification on that. D, officer. I didn't write this piece, so Sherry or Barb, can you speak to? I'm, I'm, I'm to looking the question. For, for where the. Um, article five, section three D, which is at the top of page four of the side by side. and dance to the music. Yes, please. Um, 
this is the the board members of the board and I think this was in this was in our previous bylaws also wasn't it um they will make their own decision if someone on the board needs to be removed and it's not I think it would be their own they make their own rules for how they're functioning is that correct uh, Susan mm -hmm. Actually, it wasn't in the previous bylaws. Oh, it wasn't. And part of the question was, if for some reason, for instance, that a board member couldn't attend meetings and didn't resign on their own or something else happened, could the board act to essentially make a vacancy? So that that was another thing that was pointed out by our legal counsel that it would be possible for members not to fulfill their members of the board i'm talking about trustees not to fulfill their duties and essentially yet not resign and therefore you would have fewer people acting on the board of trustees bob and then connie oh and carolyn had you know, this particular section, the way I read it is, is just that the officer, secretary, president, vice president can be voted out of office by the other members of the board of trustees. It's not to vote somebody off the board of trustees. You're right. I didn't interpret And right. so those three officers, they're not elected by the congregation. They're Correct. elected by the board of trustees. Uh, usually at the first meeting in the summertime when the new board takes takes position. And it's uh, just, you know, if they're not functioning and they're not able to function, mm -hmm. then the rest of the board says, hey, we need new leadership. And that should be within their power to do so. I, I think I got, so, you know, if the board of trustees all of a sudden decided that I was, you know, somehow deficient in my duties as president, the board could remove me as president not necessarily off the board, but they could vote to replace me if I was being derelict in my duty. That's that's accurate, yeah, what that's we're discussing. Right. Nikki? So are you making an amendment that an officer may remove by a majority of vote of the trustees then an office for cause? I would not say that this might be the place to say what every single one of those would be. Denise? Hi, Denise Hartzell. I just wanted to point out that in Article 7, duties and responsibilities of the Board of Trustees, Section 5 is about um, removing a trustee for cause in accordance with the policy manual. So I just wanted to point out that that's there because we got confused about which what we were talking about. So thanks to Bob for pointing out that we were talking about officers. So again, my question is, is there, does the group feel that there's a, Connie, you, I'm sorry, you're on my list. So I'm ahead of myself. Sorry. Bob said most of what I was going to say. The other thing is, I think if for some reason the rest of the board just felt uncomfortable about whatever without a specific cause, if the board doesn't have confidence in its leaders, then they need to have the right to change that leadership since they elected those leaders in the first place. I guess that's my mm -hmm. contribution to the discussion. I recommend the following amendment. An officer may be removed from their leadership role by a majority vote of the trustees than an office. So we're clearly distinguishing being between being removed from the board and removed from their elected role that was elected within that group of nine. Say it again. Elected by that group. All right. Questions? Yes, 
an officer may be removed from their leadership role by a majority vote of the trustees then in office. They are not removed from the board, they're removed from their leadership role. Can, can I suggest that we say from office rather than leadership role? We're gonna make an amendment to the amendment because we haven't, well, we haven't finished the an first amendment. officer so. may be removed from office, from office by, a majority vote by a majority vote of the trustees then in office. Is there any an officer from office means right. president vice president treasurer office is removed not their position as a board of trustee and then later in the document it addresses how a general member would be is this was supposed to be the fast part of the meeting. You know, I'm just going to put that out there. So um, is there need for further discussion or can we go to a vote? Vote? The vote is okay. to insert from office after removed. Okay. So the amendment is to insert from office after removed in Article 5. Section 3D. Is there a second? Bob seconded. Those in favor of inserting from office after removed in said article, please raise your voting card. Thank you. Those opposed. Thank you. Is there any question or conversation on any other part of Article 5? Are we ready to vote on Article 5? Would those in favor of Article 5, as just amended, please raise your voting card. Thank you. Those opposed? Thank you. With an over two thirds vote in favor, Article 5, as amended, is approved. Whew, we're getting there, folks. We're getting there. Article six, there was a question, I don't know if it was online or in person anymore. Any conversation, comment on any part of article six? Everybody. Online read, nothing online. All right, with no further comment uh, being offered, Again, the article is put forward by the committee. We haven't changed anything. So I don't think we need a second. Nope. We don't need a second. So all those in favor of approving Article 6 as presented by the bylaws committee, please raise your card. Thank you. Those opposed to accepting Article 6, none. All right, so there being a two thirds in favor, Article six is approved as presented. What am I on next? I can't. Article 11. 11. This is it, folks. Article 11. Article 11. Oh, is there anyone who would like to put forward comment, potential revision? I think it's Nikki. To Article 11. I'm still turning my pages. Nikki. This is it, right? It would be good. Okay. This was proposed number one where it says a finance committee shall be appointed by the board of trustees. Each appointee shall serve until they resign or are removed by the board. Um, I'd like to amend that just to say that the finance committee shall be uh, appointed by the bo board of trustees for a term of four years. I I've never seen a committee without a term and it sort of scares me. So, so um, I just, Simple amendment shall be appointed by the Board of Trustees for a term of four years. 
and each and then it can um, each appointee shall serve until they uh, the oh you know they can resign if they want to but all right so the proposed amendment is to insert for a term of four years at the end of the first sentence. Is there any conversation? Is there a second? Got a second from Bob. Is there any conversation about the proposed amendment? So someone can correct me if I am wrong, but in the time that I have been on the board, recruiting members for the finance committee has been incredibly difficult. And so really it would leave it open for those people to serve for as long as, as they are willing, instead of having to have them stop and take a break and then potentially come back. So part of it is because we've had difficulty recruiting for that role. That is my understanding. So we're here and then to Sherry. Pat Van Slambrook, I'm a new member on the finance committee and I wouldn't have accepted it if it was four years. <laughs> Plus it takes, it takes um, certain talents and experience, long-term experience is uh, good to have too, uh, as far as the church is concerned. Any further comment on the proposed amendment? Are we ready to vote on the proposed amendment? Okay, those in favor of inserting for a term of four years at the end of the first sentence of article 11, section one, please raise your voting card. Thank you. Those opposed to inserting the language, please raise your voting card. Okay. The article section stands as originally proposed. Are there any other questions or comments or proposed revisions to Article 11? Are we ready to vote? All right. All those in favor of approving Article 11 as presented by the bylaws committee, please raise your voting card. Thank you. Those of you not in favor of accepting Article 11 as written by the bylaws committee, please raise your card. There being a two thirds in favor, Article 11 is approved. All right, here's the last, here's the last, the last one. Just as a point of order, I understand that this is not required, but highly recommended that someone make a motion to, ex to accept the entire document as amended in this meeting. We don't have to go through all the stuff and that we take a final vote on the entire document as amended. Oh. <laughs> Do I have a second? You got it. I'm sorry, I, I can't. Mark Mitchell. So that's a move. Do I have a second? Elizabeth. Those in favor of approving the bylaws as amended in this meeting, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. Those opposed? Noted. With more than a two thirds vote, this document is accepted. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, this is not a one and done. Ongoing conversations can be had, and I recommend that you communicate with your members of the board so that we can respond to your 
concerns and to have your input as we move forward. And with that, I will hand it over to Rachel for some final closing words. I don't know how you all did this. It is amazing. I snuck out and got snacks throughout this meeting. So I will be very brief. Thank you. Thank you for caring enough about this church to spend this day, so much of this day here. Thank you for speaking what is true and listening to others and coming to a wisdom that we probably none of us could have found by ourselves. And for keeping the, this document open and living and it will continue to adjust and grow. So the song that I am inviting us all to close with today as we return to the wider world beyond this room is a song with many different lyrics set to it. It's a song known as Finlandia. And it was a song composed by Sibelius a hundred years ago for his country in the face of Russian aggression. So may we go out and continue to do the work of democracy and self-determination and peace. Let us go in peace and go in love. And I hope you have a snack very soon. Does he, is he willing to go to other people's houses?